Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight, two by W.W. Jacobs. A little on the shorter side, so two in the same video. The Lost Ship and Over the Side. The Lost Ship. On a fine spring morning in the early part of the present century, Tetby, a small port on the East Coast, was keeping high holiday. Tradesmen left their shops, and laborers their work, and flocked down to join the maritime element collected on the quay. In the usual way, Tetby was a quiet, dull little place, clustering in a tiny heap of town on one side of the river, and perching in scattered red-tiled cottages on the cliffs of the other. Now, however, people were grouped upon that stone quay, with its litter of fish baskets and coils of rope, waiting expectantly, for today the largest ship ever built in Tetby, by Tetby hands, was to start upon her first voyage. As they waited, discussing past Tetby ships, their builders, their voyages, and their fate, a small piece of white sail showed on the noble bark from her moorings up the river. The groups on the quay grew animated as more sail was set, and in slow motion and stately fashion, the new ship drew near. As the light breeze took her sail, she came faster, sitting in the water like a duck, her lofty mast tapering away to the sky as they broke through the white clouds of canvas. She passed within ten fathoms of the quay, and the men cheered and the women held up their children to wave farewell, for she was manned from captain to cabin boy by Tetby men and bound for the distant southern seas. Outside the harbor she altered her course somewhat and bent, like a thing of life, to the wind blowing outside. The crew sprang into the rigging and waved their caps and kissed their grimy hands to receding Tetby. They were answered by rousing cheers from the shore, hoarse and masculine, to drown the lachrymose attempts of the women. They watched her till their eyes were dim, and she was a mere white triangular speck on the horizon. Then, like a melting snowflake, she vanished into air, and the Tetby folk, some envying the bold mariners, and others thankful that their lives were cast upon the safe and pleasant shore, slowly dispersed to their homes. Months passed, and the quiet routine of Tetby went on undisturbed. Other crafts came into port, and, discharging and unloading in an easy, comfortable fashion, sailed again. The keel of another ship was being laid in the shipyard, and slowly the time came round when the return of Tetby's pride, for so she was named, might reasonably be looked for. It was feared that she might arrive in the night, the cold and cheerless night, when wife and child were abed, and even if roused to go down on to the quay, would see no more of her than her side light staining the water, and her dark form stealing cautiously up the river. They would have her come by day, to see her first on that horizon into which she had dipped and vanished, to see her come closer and closer, the good, stout ship seasoned by southern seas and southern suns, with the crew crowding the sides to gaze at Tetby, and see how the children had grown. But she came not. Day after day the watchers waited for her in vain, it was whispered at length that she was overdue, and later on, but only by those who had neither kith nor kin aboard her, that she was missing. Long after all hope had gone, wives and mothers, after the manner of their kind, watched and waited on the cheerless quay. One by one they stayed away, and forgot the dead to attend the living. Babes grew into sturdy, ruddy-faced boys and girls, boys and girls into young men and women, but no news of the missing ship, no word from the missing men. Slowly year succeeded year, and the lost ship became a legend. The man who had built her was old and gray, and time had smoothed away the sorrows of the bereaved. It was on a dark, blustering September night that an old woman sat by her fire knitting. The fire was low, for it was more for the sake of company than warmth, and it formed an agreeable contrast to the wind which whistled round the house, bearing on its wings the sound of the waves as they came crashing ashore. God help those at sea tonight, said the old woman devoutly, as a stronger gust than usual shook the house. She put her knitting in her lap and clasped her hands, and at that moment the cottage door opened. The lamp flared and smoked up the chimney with the draft, and then went out. As the old woman rose from her seat, the door closed. Who's there? she cried nervously. Her eyes were dim and the darkness sudden, but she fancied she saw something standing by the door and snatching a spill from the mantelpiece, she thrust it into the fire and relit the lamp. A man stood on the threshold, a man of middle age, with white drawn face and scrubby beard. His clothes were in rags, his hair unkempt, 
and his light gray eyes sunken and tired. The old woman looked at him and waited for him to speak. When he did so, he took a step towards her and said, Mother. With a great cry, she threw herself upon his neck and strained him to her withered bosom and kissed him. She could not believe her eyes, her senses, but clasped him convulsively and bade him speak again and wept and thanked God and laughed all in one breath. Then she remembered herself and let him tottering to the old Windsor chair, thrust him into it, and quivering with excitement, took food and drink from the cupboard and placed it before him. He ate hungrily, the old woman watching him, and standing by his side to keep his glass filled with the homemade beer. At times he would have spoken, but she motioned him to silence and bade him eat, the tears coursing down her aged cheeks as she looked at his white famished face. At length he laid down his knife and fork, and drinking off the ale, intimated that he had finished. "'My boy, my boy,' said the old woman in a broken voice, I thought you had gone down with Tetby's pride long years ago. He shook his head heavily. The captain and crew, and the good ship, asked his mother, where are they? Captain and crew, said the son, in a strange, hesitating fashion. It is a long story. The ale has made me heavy. They are... He left off abruptly and closed his eyes. Where are they? asked his mother. What happened? He opened his eyes slowly. I am tired, dead tired. I have not slept. I'll tell you in the morning. He nodded again, and the old woman shook him gently. Go to bed, then. Your old bed, Jim. It's as you left it, and it's made in the sheets aired. It's been ready for you ever since. He rose to his feet and stood swaying to and fro. His mother opened a door in the wall, and taking the lamp, lighted him up the steep wooden staircase to the room he knew so well. Then he took her in his arms in a feeble hug, and kissing her on the forehead, sat down wearily on the bed. The old woman returned to her kitchen, and falling upon her knees, remained for some time in a state of grateful, pious ecstasy. When she arose, she thought of those other women, and, snatching a shawl from its peg behind the door, ran up the deserted street with her tidings. In a very short time the town was astir, like a breath of hope, the whisper flew from house to house. Doors closed for the night were thrown open, and wondering children questioned their weeping mothers. Blurred images of husbands and fathers long since given over for dead stood out clear and distinct, smiling with bright faces upon their dear ones. At the cottage door two or three people had already collected, and others were coming up the street in an unwanted bustle. They found their way barred by an old woman, a resolute old woman, her face still working with the great joy that had come into her old life, but who refused them admittance until her son had slept. The thirst for news was uncontrollable, but with a swelling in her throat, she realized her share in Tetsby pride was safe. Women who had waited, and got patient at last after years of waitings, could not endure these additional few hours. Despair was endurable, but suspense. Ah, God, was their man alive? What did he look like? Had he aged much? He was so fatigued he could scarcely speak, said she. She had questioned him, but he was unable to reply. Give him but till the dawn, and they should know all. So they waited, for to go home and sleep was impossible. Occasionally they moved a little way up the street, but never very far, and gathering in small knots excitedly discussed the great event. It came to be understood that the rest of the crew had been cast away on an uninhabited island, could be nothing else, and would doubtlessly soon be with them all except one or two, perhaps, who were old men when the ship sailed and had probably died in the meantime. One said this in the hearing of an old woman whose husband, if alive, would be an extremely old age, but she smiled peacefully, albeit her lip trembled, and said she only expected to hear of him, that was all. The suspense became almost unendurable. Would this man never awake? Would it never be dawn? The children were chilled with the wind, but their elders could scarcely have felt an arctic frost. With growing impatience they waited, glancing at times at two women who held themselves somewhat aloof from the others, two women who had married again, and whose second husbands waited, awkwardly enough, with them. Slowly the weary, windy night wore away, the old woman, deaf to their appeals, still keeping her door fast. The dawn was not yet, though the oft-consulted watches announced it near at hand. It was very close now, and the watchers collected by the door. 
it was undeniable that things were seen a little more distinctly. One could see better the gray, eager faces of his neighbors. They locked upon the door, and the old woman's eyes filled as she opened it and saw those faces. Unasked and unchid, they invaded the cottage and crowded around the door. I will go up and fetch him, said the old woman. If each could have heard the beating of each other's hearts, the noise would have been deafening. But as it was, there was complete silence, except for some overwrought woman's sob. The old woman opened the door leading to the room above, and with the slow, deliberate steps of age, ascended the stairs, and those below heard her calling softly to her son. Two or three minutes passed, and then she was heard descending the stairs again, alone. The smile, the pity, had left her face, and she seemed dazed and estranged. I cannot wake him, she said piteously. He sleeps so sound. He is fatigued. I have shaken him, but still he sleeps. As she stopped and looked appealingly round, the other old woman took her hand, and pressing it led her to a chair. Two of the men sprang quickly up the stairs. They were absent but a short while, and then they came back down like men bewildered and distraught. No need to speak. A low wail of utter misery rose from the women, and was caught up and repeated by the crowd outside, for the only man who could have set their hearts at rest had escaped the perils of the deep and died quietly in his bed. The End Over the Side Of all classes of men, those who follow the sea are probably the most prone to superstition, afloat upon the black waste of waters, at the mercy of wind and sea, with vast depths and strange creatures below them, a belief in the supernatural is easier than ashore, under the cheerful gas lamps. Strange stories of the sea are plentiful, and an incident which happened within my own experience has made me somewhat chary of dubbing a man fool or coward because he has encountered something he cannot explain. There are stories of the supernatural with prosaic sequels. There are others to which the sequel has never been published. I was fifteen years old at the time, and as my father, who had a strong objection to the sea, would not apprentice me to it, I shipped before the mast on a sturdy little brig called the Endeavour, bound for Riga. She was a small craft, but the skipper was as fine a seaman as anyone could wish for, and, in fair weather, an easy man to sail under. Most boys have a rough time of it when they first go to sea, but, with a strong sense of what was good for me, I had attached myself to a brawny, good-natured infant named Bill Smith, and it was soon understood that whoever struck me hit Bill by proxy. Not that the crew were particularly brutal, but a sound cuffing occasionally is held by most seamen to be beneficial to a lad's health and morals. The only really spiteful fellow among them was a man named Jem Dad. He was a morose, sallow-looking man of about forty, with a strong taste for the supernatural, and a stronger taste still for frightening his fellows with it. I have seen Bill almost afraid to go on deck of a night for his trick at the wheel after a few of his reminiscences. Rats were a favorite topic with him, and he would never allow one to be killed if he could help it, for he claimed for them that they were the souls of drowned sailors, hence their love of ships and their habit of leaving them when they became unseaworthy. He was a firm believer in the transmigration of souls, some idea of which he had, no doubt, picked up in eastern ports, and gave his shivering auditors to understand that his arrangements for his own immediate future were already perfected. We were six or seven days out when a strange thing happened. Dad was the second watch one night, and Bill was to relieve him. They were not very strict aboard the brig in fair weather, and when a man's time was up, he just made the wheel fast and, running forward, shouted down the forecastle. On this night I happened to awake suddenly, in time to see Bill slip out of his bunk and stand by me, rubbing his red eyelids with his knuckles. "'Dad's giving me a long time,' he whispered, seeing that I was awake. "'It's a whole hour after his time.' He pattered up on deck, and I was just turning over, thankful that I was too young to have a watch to keep, when he came softly down again and, taking me by the shoulders, shook me roughly. "'Jack,' he whispered. "'Jack.' I raised myself on my elbows and, in the light of the smoking lamp, saw that he was shaking all over. "'Come on deck,' he said thickly. I put on my clothes and followed him quietly to the sweet, cool air above. It was a beautiful, clear night, but, from his manner, I looked nervously around for some cause of alarm. I saw nothing. The deck was deserted, 
except for the solitary figure at the wheel. Look at him, whispered Bill, bending a contorted face to mine. I walked aft a few steps, and Bill followed slowly. Then I saw that Jem Dad was leaning forward clumsily on the wheel, with his hands clenched on the spokes. He's asleep, said I, stopping short. Bill breathed hard. He's in a queer sleep, said he. Kind of trance, more like. Go closer. I took fast hold of Bill's sleeve, and we both went. The light of the stars was sufficient to show that Dad's face was very white, and that his dim, black eyes were wide open, and staring in a very strange and dreadful manner straight before him. Dad, said I softly, Dad. There was no reply, and, with a view of arousing him, I tapped one sinewy hand as it gripped the wheel, and even tried to loosen it. He remained immovable, and, suddenly with a great cry, my courage deserted me, and Bill and I fairly bolted down into the cabin and woke the skipper. Then we saw how it was with Jem, and two strong seamen forcibly loosened the grip of those rigid fingers and, laying him on the deck, covered him with a piece of canvas. The rest of the night two men stayed at the wheel and, gazing fearfully at the outline of the canvas, longed for dawn. It came at last, and, breakfast over, the body was sewn up in canvas, and the skipper held a short service compiled from a Bible which belonged to the mate, and what he remembered of the burial service proper. Then the corpse went overboard with a splash, and the men, after standing awkwardly together for a few minutes, slowly dispersed to their duties. For the rest of that day we were all very quiet and restrained, pity for the dead man being mingled with the dread of taking the wheel when night came. "'The wheel's haunted,' said the cook, solemnly. "'Mark my words. There's more of you will be took the same way Dad was.' The cook, like myself, had no watch to keep. The men bore up pretty well until night came on again, and then they unanimously resolved to have a double watch. The cook, sorely against his will, was impressed into the service, and I, glad to oblige my patron, agreed to stay up with Bill. Some of the pleasure had vanished by the time night came, and I seemed only just to have closed my eyes when Bill came and, with a rough shake or two, informed me that the time had come. Any hope that I might have had of escaping the ordeal was at once dispelled by his expectant demeanor and the helpful way in which he assisted me with my clothes and, yawning terribly, I followed him on the deck. The night was not so clear as the preceding one and the air was chilly with a little moisture in it. I buttoned up my jacket and thrust my hands in my pockets. Everything quiet? asked Bill as he stepped up and took the wheel. Aye, aye, said Roberts, quiet as the grave, and followed by his willing mate, he went below. I sat on the deck by Bill's side as, with a light touch on the wheel, he kept the brig to her course. It was weary work sitting there, doing nothing, and thinking of the warm berth below, and I believe that I should have fallen asleep, but that my watchful companion stirred me with his foot whenever he saw me nodding. I suppose I must have sat there, shivering and yawning, for about an hour, when, tired of inactivity, I got up and went and leaned over the side of the vessel. The sound of the water gurgling and lapping was so soothing that I began to doze. I was recalled to my senses by a smothered cry from Bill, and, running to him, I found him staring to port in an intense and uncomfortable fashion. At my approach, he took one hand from the wheel and gripped my hand so tightly that I was like to have screamed with the pain of it. Jack, said he, in a shaky voice, while you was away, something popped its head up and looked over the ship's side. "'You've been dreaming,' said I, in a voice which was a very fair imitation of Bill's own. "'Dreaming,' repeated Bill. "'Dreaming. Ah, look there.' He pointed with outstretched finger, and my heart seemed to stop beating as I saw a man's head appear above the side. For a brief space it peered at us in silence, and then a dark figure sprang like a cat onto the deck and stood crouching a short distance away. A mist came before my eyes, and my tongue failed me. But Bill let off a roar, such as I have never heard before or since. It was answered from below, both aft and forward, and the men came running up on deck just as they left their beds. "'What's up?' shouted the skipper, glancing aloft. For answer, Bill pointed to the intruder, and the men, who had just caught sight of him, came up and formed a compact knot by the wheel. "'Come over the side it did,' panted Bill." come over like a ghost out of the sea. 
The skipper took one of the small lamps from the binnacle and, holding it aloft, walked boldly up to the cause of alarm. In the little patch of light we saw a ghastly black-bearded man, dripping with water, regarding us with unwinking eyes, which glowed red in the light of the lamp. "'Where did you come from?' asked the skipper. The figure shook its head. "'Where did you come from?' he repeated, walking up and laying his hand on the other's shoulder. Then the intruder spoke, but in a strange fashion and strange words. We leaned forward to listen, but even when he repeated them, we could make nothing of them. "'He's a foreigner,' said Roberts. "'Blessed if I've ever heard that lingo before,' said Bill. "'Does anybody recognize it?' Nobody did, and the skipper, after another attempt, gave it up, and, falling back on the universal language of signs, pointed first to the man and then to the sea. The other understood him, and, in a heavy, slovenly fashion, portrayed a man drifting in an open boat and clutching and clambering up the side of a passing ship. As his meaning dawned upon us, we rushed to the stern and, leaning over, peered into the gloom, but the night was dark and we saw nothing. Well, said the skipper, turning to Bill with a mighty yawn, take him below, give him some grub, and the next time a gentleman calls on you, don't make such a confounded row about it. He went below, followed by the mate, and after some slight hesitation, Robert stepped up to the intruder and signed to him to follow. He came stolidly enough, leaving a trail of water on the deck, and, after changing into the dry things we gave him, fell to, but without much appearance of hunger, upon some salt beef and biscuits, regarding us between bites with black, lackluster eyes. He seems as though he's a-walking in his sleep, said the cook. He ain't very hungry, said one of the men. He seems to mumble his food. Hungry, repeated Bill, who had just left the wheel. Of course he ain't famished. He had his tea last night. The men stared at him in bewilderment. Don't you see, said Bill, still in a hoarse whisper. Ain't you ever seen them eyes before? Don't you know what he used to say about dying? It's Jem Dad come back to us. Jem Dad got another man's body, as he always said he would. Rot, said Roberts, trying to speak bravely. But he got up and, with the others, huddled together at the end of the full castle and stared in a bewildered fashion at the sodden face and short, squat figure of our visitor. For his part, having finished his meal, he pushed his plate from him and, leaning back on the locker, looked at the empty bunks. Roberts caught his eye and, with a nod and wave of his hand, indicated the bunks. The fellow rose from the locker and, amid a breathless silence, climbed into one of them, Jeb Dad's. He slept in the dead sailor's bed that night, the only man in the full castle who did sleep properly, and turned out heavily and lumpishly in the morning for breakfast. The captain had him on deck after the meal, but could make nothing of him. To all his questions, he replied in the strange tongue of the night before, and, though our fellows had been to many ports, and knew a word or two of several languages, none of them recognized it. The skipper gave it up at last, and, left to himself, he stared about him for some time, regardless of our interest in his movements, and then, leaning heavily against the side of the ship, stayed there so long that we thought he must have fallen asleep. "'He's half dead now,' whispered Roberts. "'Hush,' said Bill. Maybe he's been in the water a week or two, and can't quite make it out. See how he's looking at it now. He stayed on deck all day in the sun, but, as night came on, returned to the warmth of the forecastle. The food we gave him remained untouched, and he took little or no notice of us, though I fancied that he saw the fear we had of him. He slept again in the dead man's bunk, and when morning came still lay there. Until dinner time nobody interfered with him and then Roberts, pushed forward by the others, approached him with some food. He motioned it away with a dirty, bloated hand, and, making signs for water, drank it eagerly. For two days he stayed there quietly, the black eyes always open, the stubby fingers always on the move. On the third morning, Bill, who had conquered his fear sufficiently to give him water occasionally, called softly to us. "'Come and look at him,' said he. "'What's the matter with him?' He's dying, said the cook, with a shudder. He can't be going to die yet, said Bill blankly. As he spoke, the man's eyes seemed to get softer and more lifelike, and he looked at us piteously and helplessly. From face to face he gazed in mute inquiry, and then, striking his chest feebly with his fist, uttered two words. 
We looked at each other blankly, and he repeated them eagerly, and again touched his chest. It's his name, said the cook, and we all repeated them. He smiled in an exhausted fashion, and then, rallying his energies, held up a forefinger. As we stared at this new riddle, he lowered it, and held up all four fingers, doubled. Come away, quavered the cook. He's putting a spell on us. We drew back at that, back further still, as he repeated the motions. Then Bill's face cleared suddenly, and he stepped towards him. He means his wife and young'uns, he shouted eagerly. This ain't no gem, Dad. It was good then to see how our fellows drew round the dying sailor and strove to cheer him. Bill, to show he understood the finger business, nodded cheerily and held his hand at four different heights from the floor. The last was very low, so low that the man set his lips together and strove to turn his heavy head from us. Poor devil, said Bill. He wants us to tell his wife and children what's become of him. He must have been dying when he came aboard. What's his name again? But the name was not easy to English lips, and we had already forgotten it. Ask him again, said the cook, and write it down. Who's got a pen? He went to look for one, as Bill turned to the sailor to get him to repeat it. Then he turned round again, and eyed us blankly, for, by this time, the owner had himself forgotten it. The End